So, um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you, and welcome to our Access to Space for All series of webinars on conducting R&D in hypergravity and microgravity. This is our fourth webinar of our nine webinar series, and today we will talk about life science part three, pharmacology. So before we begin, First, I'd like to kindly ask you to turn off your cameras and your microphones. We're able to mute you, but we cannot turn off your cameras, so please make sure to turn off your cameras. Second, please use the chat box to ask any questions. We will have a dedicated time for Q&A at the end, but whenever you have questions or comments, please use the chat box to write them down. Um, we will collect them and answer them at the end. Third, please answer our questionnaire form that we will put a link in the chat box later on. My colleague Wenbin will be active in the chat box, so he will be putting up questionnaire links and also some useful links um, uh, relating to our initiative or to the presentation, so please make sure to check out the things he shared as well. And last but not least, please use the hashtag access to space for all. If you're on social media, please help us promote this webinar. We are active on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn at UNUSA. So um, I don't know how many of you have followed us um, through this whole webinar, but we began from the end of April. Our main objective of this webinar series is to raise awareness of the many types of R&D done in hypergravity and microgravity and to really trigger the interest in this amazing field. Through these webinars, we want to provide theoretical knowledge that can support hands-on opportunities, such as our Access to Space for All initiative programs, but also the many other available opportunities in the future. The learning outcomes of these webinars are, first, the fundamentals, the special characteristics and advantages of the hypergravity and microgravity environment, Second, the overview of what type of research can be done in hypergravity and microgravity and its applications. So today we'll dive into pharmacology. Third, the overview of available modified gravity platforms, the areas of application and its benefits. Fourth, how to develop an experiment to be conducted in these special areas. So you'll be able to have some technical insights on this as well. And lastly, the overview of the available experiment opportunities and the existing networks, organizations, and experts that are already in this field. So as you can see, we started with the introduction and we have dived into life science first. From next week, we will go into physical science after that technology demonstration. The last two webinars are dedicated to um, explaining about the UN USA opportunities and also the different regional activities done by the space agencies. I'd like to emphasize that the links for the webinars are all the same, so you can use this same link to join in any of the webinars in the future. And I know most of you here have registered, that's why you're here, so you don't have to register anymore. If you have other colleagues, friends that um, didn't join in today or have never joined in our webinars, please ask them to register, and then um, they can use the same link for all the webinars in the future. So um, the webinar information is all uploaded on our Access to Space for All initiative website, which is the first um, URL you see there. The webinar recordings and the presentations will be posted to the past webinars of the Access to Space for All initiative page, which is a different page, but it is linked to our first page. So when you get lost, just go to our Access to Space for All initiative website. Everything will be uploaded, um, updated there. Also, the recordings of our webinars can be found on our YouTube channel at the UN Office for Outer Space Affairs. So um, just to emphasize, our Access to Space for initiative looks like this. We have eight opportunities and we have two currently open for applications. The first one is called KiboCube under the satellite development track. Um, this is in partner with our with the Japanese Exploration Agency, JAXA. Um, this is an opportunity to deploy a 1U CubeSat from the ISS, ISS um, experiment module Kibo. Um, this is open until the 31st of May. And our second opportunity that is open is under the hypergravity microgravity track. It's called Drop Test in collaboration with DARM and DLR. Um, through drop tests, you will be able to conduct microgravity experiments using the Bremen Drop Tower, and this is open until the end of June. So if you're interested in applying for these opportunities, please make sure to check out our website. Um, the Access to Space for Our Initiative website has links to both KiboCube and drop tests, so please make sure to check it out. 
OK, so going into today's content, um, we will have the first professional talk um, about pharmacology research and development um, from Dr. Li Shan Tong for 45 minutes. After that, um, we will have a student talk giving a concrete example of the pharmacology R&D done. Um, we will have Audrey talk for us for 15 minutes. And after that, we will have a dedicated Q&A session. So as I said earlier, if you have any questions, please make sure to write it in the chat so that we can collect it at the end and um, answer, it, answer them for you there. And also in the afternoon time of Vienna, so 4.30 Central Eastern time, we will have the same sessions, but with different speakers. Um, for the professional talk, we will have Dr. Anjali Gupta from Axiom Space. For the student talk, we'll have um, Tej from the University of Nottingham. So if you're interested in um, these talks as well, please join us again for the afternoon session. OK, so now I'd like to give the floor to Dr. Li Shan Tong. So if I may um, give you a more details about Dr. Li Shan. So she is an assistant professor at the Division of Pharmacy Practice, uh, Pharmacy Practice and Policy. Prior to her appointment at the division, she worked as a lecturer in medicines management and at the University of Tasmania, Australia. Li Shan obtained her PhD from the University of Nottingham, and she has worked as a pharmacist in various areas, which includes territorial hospital, general practice, and community. Li Shan's main research goal is to be the catalyst to improve clinical practice by utilizing evidence-based research. She is the lead pharmacy practice researcher in astropharmacy. There are so many things I can um, explain about Li Shan, but um, I think she'll do a better job of uh, introducing herself. So I will give the floor to Dr. Li Shan Ton. Hi, I'm uh, just trying to share my screen. Yep, no worries. Okay, so yeah, do you see the screen? Yet? Mm -hmm. It looks good. Okay. All right. So, um, good morning, everybody. As uh, Hazuki said, that uh, my name is Li Shen, and I work in the University of Nottingham. So we're just gonna get straight into um, to get straight into the talk. So um, there is much fragmentation in the use of the descriptors for the different disciplines that make up pharmacy and pharmacology sector, and the different laws and regulation in this discipline in every country. So for the sake of this talk, the term pharmacological countermeasures will be used to refer to any drug, medication, or non-food nutritional supplement used to improve health. So a little bit uh, about me. So uh, I'm from Malaysia and uh, I uh, have a background of pharmacy. So that's me uh, enjoying my undergraduate in Scotland, listening to men playing uh, bagpipes. So I then worked as a leukemia um, based pharmacist. Uh, and um, after that, I worked in a GP based pharmacy, so a general practice based pharmacy. So I worked with ab Aboriginal patients as well as in more rural areas. I then decided to do my PhD, and then after my PhD, I moved to Australia to lecture in medicines management. So uh, if you don't know that animal on the right hand corner, so that's a that's a, a wombat. So it's a giant guinea pig version of a kangaroo. So it has a, a pouch. So Australia is uh, quite a nice country. My research expertise are to improve medicines management and improving healthcare services using qualitative and quantitative research. So I am particularly interested in osteoporosis um, and um, due to the recent you know, um, racism attacks uh, with um, East Asian, um, I also use my skills to look into discriminations um, with relation to COVID. And of course, why I'm here is because I do research in astropharmacy. So um, as part of this talk, I've been asked to sort of explain my journey into astropharmacy. And um, I think that I'm uh, quite a good example of someone who entered the space sector 
without having uh, any prior training in space. So don't feel like if you're not in the space sector, you can cannot ever join it. Um, there are some challenges, is it? Because people have been there longer, so you do need to uh, you know, have a steeper learning curve, but you can do it. And I was mainly led into this field by curiosity. So it was simply just me being curious about something that my senior colleague has done. And all I did was interview him, and, uh, sorry, email him. And then, you know, we had conversations and then now we're friends and he's my mentor and collaborator in all the work that we do. It is a lot, a lot, a lot of hard work in academia. It's already quite challenging when you want to do research, but when you throw in space, you need a lot more creativity and innovation, but it is also much more uh, exciting in my opinion. So once you put in the hard work, you need to start, start growing your network in this area. You need to find who are your people who you can work with. Um, and then you might find people to, to criticize constructively of your idea because you are not from the space sector. So you might have misconceptions about what it was or you might not have all the information because quite often um, space staff are quite confidential, especially if you're doing um, patient work or astronaut work because, you know, there's a small number of them. It's easy to identify them. So a lot of it are quite confidential. So you might not have enough information and you do need to take that um, feedback that you get, grow and be patient and refine your ideas and have a strong seminar to push on. Um, I think it's also important to have fun when you're in this area so that you can push through all the challenges. So I would definitely say that how I got into this was curiosity. Um, uh, and you know, there's this saying that um, curiosity kills the cat. But people don't know that the second phrase of that is curiosity kills the cat and satisfaction brought it back. So hopefully there is um, happiness for those of us who are curious. Um, another example of, you know, not being from the field, but you can be in a space sector. So uh, a rocket company called Astra is recently hiring a librarian. So, you know, you can be in a space sector even if you're not from the science field. So now we go to the content. Um, I'm going to give a brief overview about the types of health problems and the medication used in space. Um, it's a very general one, so hopefully that's a little bit of everything for all sorts of viewers today. I'm also going to talk about uh, the types of space travelers, um, how to begin doing a research, and then what are the types of platform uh, and examples of research that we have in pharmacological countermeasures and talk about the future and the benefits. <coughs> So as I've said, I'm interested in osteoporosis, so I'm interested in bones, so I will have to talk about bones in space. And it is quite a, a important area to look at um, because the weightlessness does affect your bones. So by the time your spacecraft reaches an escape velocity, um, there is no more high G-force and Earth G-force is gone. <clears throat> so as a result, people experience weightlessness. And um, so uh, there is no... No, no gravitational pull and people feel lighter and like a feather and they can float around. And our bones play an important part as a structure that supports our body and stores the calcium. So it retains, uh, it retains fracture resistance by remodeling through a balance of reabsorption of the uh, of the calcium and then of bone and then it um, and then formation so it's a process that keeps going on reabsorption and formation but in microgravity uh, environment because of the reduced loading stimuli there is an increased bone reabsorption and no change or possibility of a uh, bone formation so, a so, so, so you have increased reabsorption, but you might have reduced formation of the bone. So this causes a decrease in bone mass. And when you have a decrease in bone mass, it increases your risk of fracture, which becomes a real um, problem. So to give you uh, some figures to that, um, astronauts are losing bone density at around 1% per month or 10% um, in six months. And people on Earth who are elderly, like osteoporotic patients, loses 1% up to 1.5% per year. So it is very much um, accelerated. And when you think about it, when you have reabsorption of uh, your bones, you have more calcium. So that also increases the risk of getting kidney stones. Some of the other problems that they think the cause of this is uh, a lack of vitamin D because you can't simply take a stroll outside 
um, to get vitamin D to help you with your absorption of um, calcium. So there's also muscle loss. So that also weakens um, the protection around the bone. So what do they do about this? So um, they do a lot of exercise, a lot of weight bearing exercise. Um, they also don't know that if you come back down to earth, whether your bone mass would become back to normal. So exercise is a, a, a very important way to maintain your bone mass in, in space. So they spend a lot of time doing that, but because we're doing pharmacological countermeasures today, um, sorry, we're going to focus on the drugs. So um, the first line medication for osteoporosis is biphosphonates. So um, and there are various kinds of biphosphonates, and I'm only listing two there, which is alendronic acid and zolendronic acid. So how biphosphonates work is that they slow the rate the bone is broken down in your body. And um, its effect is quite slow, so it takes 6 to 12 minutes. Uh, to, sorry, I'm still not awake. 6 to 12 months. Um, and um, it, if you compare that to Panadol or Paracetamol, you know, in one hour you can get effect, but because the remodeling of the bone is a slow process, um, the effect takes 6 to 12 months to, to, uh, to show. And uh, it can give it, be given in oral or injection form. And um, uh, its oral form, which is what the astronauts took, is administered once weekly. Uh, and there are, for a pharmacist, when you see a biphosphonates, you you sort of think that this is a drug that, oh, this is something I need to counsel the patient because it's quite a particular one with a lot of instructions. So firstly, you take it once a week. So quite often patients forget. And um, you do need to take it with an empty stomach with a full glass of water. And you need to stand up straight for 30 minutes after taking them. You also need to wait between 30 minutes and two hours before eating food or drinking any other fluids. So I don't know how standing straight works in space, but if you don't do all these things, you have an increased risk of having stomach problems. So you can get the irritation of your food pipe, you can get swallowing problems, you can get stomach pain, and if you're on high dose, there is a risk of the osteonecrosis of the jaw. So how NASA decided to use these medications in space is that they tested it on bed rest studies first. So bed rest studies are a study where in, instead of you lying down flat, you tilt. So I'll show you a picture later. So you tilt it and then um, it kind of simulates the bones, uh, the microgravity, and then it also simulates the bone loss. So they tested biphosphonates and, they sh and the participants showed that it uh, improves, reduces um, uh, the loss of bone mass, and then they decided to use it in uh, astronauts. So then the astronaut used, there were nine of them who used this, and then one dropped out prior to going on a mission because um, that person had stomach issues, and then one more dropped out um, during during the mission as they also had uh, stomach pain. So that makes us think with um, you know osteoporosis, there are so many more newer um, newer drugs that you know you could could use you know for example you can give zolendronic acid which is intravenous and it lasts for a year so you could do things like that or you could try newer drugs like danosumab and teriperitide which are intramuscular injections so we do need to think about updating the medicines that are being used in space so other um, health issues uh, in space is space sickness. So when you go up to space, um, your fluids in your ear, which help you balance, uh, get, gets, um, you know, floats around. And then your eyes are seeing something different. So these messages are normally sent to your brain to help you balance. But, but in space, because they're not telling you the same thing, your brain gets confused and then you get dizzy and you get nausea and you get space sickness, which is kind of similar to motion sickness, car sickness, sea sickness. So astronauts used to take cyclizin. Um, however, it was found to be effective, but 10%, uh, there's a 10% risk of being drowsy. And if you think about 10% being drowsy in a high risk area with all sorts of tedious tasks, um, it's quite dangerous. So then they tried hyosin uh, and then they combated the drowsy with dexamphetamine. But currently now they think that it's better for the astronauts to, to experience it for two or three days and let the space sickness go away because it's self-limiting and it stops after that. They do still use uh, diamond hydronate transdermal patches during um, spacewalk as well as a landing and um, launching. 
um, just because it's very, it could be fatal if you um, vomit in your space, so as you can imagine. So other health problems are um, rashes and uh, hypersensitivities and allergies. So astronaut archival health records indicate that antihistamines were the most prescribed medicines during flight for chronic conditions that persisted for more than seven days. And if it's for an acute issue, which lasts less than seven days, antihistamines were second only to sleep medicines. So there is a, a lot of antihistamine and topical oral steroids going on. So skin rash was the most uh, reported event with 1.12 per flight, per flight year. So I touch about sleep medicine. So, you know, your circadian rhythm is messed up in space. Um, so, um, because, uh, so the sleep, the sunlight and everything is different. So your body, you know, it's harder to sleep. So astronauts do take uh, melatonin, which is a naturally produced um, hormone in the human body. And it's a popular over-the-counter sleep aid. They also do take caffeine for a, a quick energy boost. And as the last resort, they do, they do, they are able to get a prescribed sleep medicine such as sopidum and uh, zalpilon. Uh, and they do test it before they go um, out in space. So I could go um, on and on and on about, uh, you know, all the medicines up there, but uh, there is too much. And, uh, you know, this is just a, a brief list of what was taken. And um, if you if you Google, you can find interesting stories uh, attached to all these medicines that what happened. So as you can see, antihistamines are there, sleep medicines are there. Uh, aspirin for pain and headache. Um, they also have a lot of stomach medicine, nasal decongestion. So we have quite a lot of medicines being taken up there. And so the key challenges is that um, it is estimated that the rate of significant illness or injury, such as stroke, myocardial infection, intercerebral hemorrhage, appendicitis, or bone fractures, or death on submarines, uh, Antarctica expeditions, military aviations, and space flight is 0 0.06 cases per person year. So with a crew of six in a 36 month trip with a 0 0.06 chance, the probability is 67 and that it's really high. To make things more complicated, our drugs are also quite different, work quite differently in space. So drug regimens such as dosage rate or release will have to be altered or specifically tailored to individuals depending on the time in space or other adaptation. So there was a study here with paracetamol and you know it shows that the absorption on day two is similar, day three is double, day four is half. And this is paracetamol. So paracetamol is quite an easy drug. It has a huge, what we call nerve therapeutic window. So if you fluctuate the absorption quite a lot, you don't get toxicity and you don't get it to be ineffective. But what if we have a drug which is a smaller narrow therapeutic effect uh, window? So if you fluctuate a bit, it becomes toxicity. And you know, we really don't want that to happen. So the changes in pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamics uh, in space are difficult to predict and could be subject dependent. We also then need to think about radiation. So radiation, we know in the uh, International Space Station is about 10 times more and radiation is bad for the body so it uh, you know, increases cancer risk, causes central nervous system, nausea and vomiting and even death. So if we go further into space there are like the moon mission there is more radiation. There is also solar flares but this is more predictable and so let's hope that it's prediction is cyclical and we can predict it but radiation is a very very important thing that we need to tackle um, when we go to space. So we talk about all the things that happen in the body uh, when we go to space. Now we need to think about whether, you know, if they have effect on a human body, probably it's going to be ha have effect on the medicines. So um, we're going to look at medication stability as an example. So medication stability refers to um, um, shelf life or expiry date of a medication. Um, a study found that 87% uh, of the medications uh, flown to the ISS has a shelf life of less than 24 months. So when we go to Mars and when we plan to colonize Mars or stay longer on the moon, 24 months is a very, very short period 
of having medicines and it does limit exploration. So the opportunistic study um, looked into uh, for 550 days uh, of the med degradation and impurities of several medicines and they found that um, aspirin, ibuprofen, loratidine and zolpidem, which is our pain, um, antihistamine and sleep medicine has degradation and impurities and some of them were beyond the recommended standards. Another study looked at antibiotics. So they uh, sent up medicines on space as well, and they found that augmentin became most unstable. So if you know about augmentin, there is a special uh, segment called the clavulonic uh, segment of the, the drug, and that one degraded and it reduces the, efficacy, the potency by 50%, so the efficacy drops. Imipinum and silastatin was okay, but they don't know why. So um, you do need to repack your medications when you bring it up to space because uh, you know there's not enough space and it's really expensive uh, for you to, to send your medications up. So sometimes they repackage it to make to optimize the, the, the amount of space the medication took. So they don't know whether it was because augmenting was removed from the commercial packaging that caused it to degrade faster because they didn't do that for imipinum. They also don't know whether it was because of radiation, whether it was because of vibration, whether it was because of humidity. So we don't know what are the causes that um, reduces the stability, but we just know that there is something happening, but we're not really sure why. So lots and lots to do in that area as well. So there are medication kits in the International Space Station. There are over 100 medications there and uh, they are resupplied uh, every six months. So it's not a problem back then because you can resupply. And you know, if there is a medical emergency, um, the astronaut can um, abort the mission and have an early return. But that's not the case if you're going for uh, to Mars or somewhere further. So who are the uh, space travelers? So we know that uh, we're familiar with our pioneering explorers such as astronauts, so they are fit and trained uh, people. Where else we are looking at space tourism, we're coming closer and closer to reality, you know, with plans to go to the moon and things like that. And also people wanting to commercialize the moon and you know make bases there. So there might be engineers and miners working there. So what this brings is that there might be a variety of people going up with different types of medical condition, meaning that they will be taking different types of uh, medication. They could be taking a cocktail of medication and then the needs of these patients with regards to medicine use is quite different from an astronaut. So we do need to think about how we're we going to make medication use safe and effective for a variety of space travelers. So this slide um, um, was to talk about how experiments are developed um, and I did think quite a while on how to um, talk about this because there are so many different kinds of areas and I didn't just want to pinpoint uh, a, a particular area because in pharmacology and pharmacological countermeasures there's just so much to do so I will explain generally how we develop a research proposal in academia. So um, the first step is of course to look into what are you interested in, so what are your interests. Then when you find that out, you need to go into literature, and you need to read up on what are the literature that has been done, or whether it is really a problem, is there really a gap in this idea that you have that you're trying to solve. You need to find out what's been done, what uh, works, what doesn't work, uh, what innovation might be needed. And is your idea novel? Maybe someone has done it before. So you do need to, you know, not, not use Google and read news only or, you know, like um, uh, you need to use peer peer reviewed journals. So go to PubMed, go to Nature, those kind of journals, understand those, what has been done. And then the next thing you need to think about, is this area right now important? For example, if you were talking about uh, five or ten years ago, people who were talking about medicines use in space back then, um, the idea wasn't um, so um, urgent because you could resupply every six months. 
But now this topic has become much more hot because we want to go there longer. We have an opportunity to go there longer. More people with different medical conditions can go there. So you need to think about whether your topic right now is important or, or not. are we more worried about something else that you know the funding needs to be tackled. So then you need to think about the skills that you need to develop. Um, do you have the skills? Do you need to learn it? Or do you need to find someone who has that skill to help you in your project? You of course, need to look for equipment if you need to use any equipment. Then you have to grow your network, get to know people, get their advice, you know, uh, in the in the area that you're interested in. And the normally the rate, the limiting factor is funding. So with all your ideas and all these things that you have learned and all the network you have built, you have to apply for funding to do research. So that's generally how the process works to develop an experiment. So as for the platforms, uh, I will only go through this uh, briefly because um, my colleague Anjali uh, will be talking about all sorts of different different um, technologies that Axiom has, and I don't want to steal her thunder or overlap too much. So, uh, so um, of course, we know that we can do experiments in the International Space Station, and we can send payloads up there, or we can use uh, um, other private commercial companies like Blue Origin or Virgin Galactic to send payloads up. So payloads are, um, are boxes of various size that are really, really expensive. You, you, when I started, I hadn't realized how expensive is it to do an experiment in space. So they are uh, compact boxes where your experiment need to fit into and uh, you need to 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 get the funding to send it up. So it needs to be compact and has the most outcome because the price tag is very high. Um, so that's payloads. You can send it for to, to the ISS or you can do uh, send it with um, Virgin Galactic where you can get uh, a couple of minutes of microgravity. You can also use sounding rockets. Uh, sounding rockets are rockets that go up and then your experiment has a few minutes of uh, microgravity as well. So you can test proof of concept types of research. Uh, we've also spoken briefly about um, uh, analog, so such a bit rest study. So in the right hand corner, you can see uh, a person lying down and you can see that the, the head is tilted, the head of the bed is tilted down. So that is what we call bed rest studies. You can also use mice. So there are mice up in the International Space Station, but a lot of people want to do experiment in that. So your idea has to be one that really answers the questions that are needed and have the most outcomes. You can also, so those are things that you do to get microgravity up, up in uh, space, or you can use analog. But there is another type of research tools that you can use that we already have in space. So for example, part of my research skills are using social and policy research type. So I will show you an example of that, but it doesn't need me to send payloads up. It's about exploring um, with the people what the needs are of the space sector. Uh, another example of adapting what we currently do to the space sector is I have a, a colleague who does manufacturing. So he's an expert in manufacturing on Earth. But what he does is he uses his current skills to think about how it can be used in the space sector and he's developing innovative ways to manufacture drugs. Um, I nicked the bottom picture from uh, UNOSAS um, website, but uh, as uh, Hazuki has highlighted, we do have a uh, uh, they do have a lot of facilities which you can use. So um, one of the example is the drop tower experiment. Uh, and that is uh, 146 meters high where you can drop your experiment. So if you can find a research question with regards to pharmacological countermeasures, you might be able to, to use that. Um, they also have hyper hypergest. So that can create 1G to 20G uh, experiments. It's a machine that spins things around and it, and it can maintain that for one month to, to six months. So that's uh, all the facilities that you can use with, um, um, with them. So they also have the China Space Station, um, the Dream Chaser, which runs orbital experiment payloads. They also have Bartolomeo, which is an extended platform on the ISS. So, I think there's a lot of innovation and creativity needed when you want to do experiments in the space sector. Um, you know, for example, maybe we don't actually have to solve um, the loss of bone mass in in space. You know, what if what if what we need to do is supplement something else? You know, are we why are we applying our what we need 
on Earth into space. I do think that at some point we need to develop models that are for space and not tackle what we have in Earth and develop something completely new for the people living in space. So that's for all of you to think about. So now we go to examples of um, research. So um, the research that I was talking about to use social and policy science to in the space sector. So I'm from a pharmacy background and I wanted to understand if there was a need for pharmacy services or pharmacists uh, in the space sector. So currently there are pharmacies, but it's not something that's very widely known, you know, such as flight surgeons. There are a lot of them, but pharmacists, there are much, much, much less. So I wanted to explore stakeholders perspective towards the role of astropharmacy in the space sector. And so astropharmacy addresses the question of how pioneers and explorers are to receive effective medical and pharmaceutical care. So social policy type research uses qualitative research and is quite often used in exploratory studies like this. So our data is text, is what people say rather than um, numbers or going in the lab. So we interview and we do group, group discussion with stakeholders, we record them and then we transcribe them word for word and then we thematically analyze them, which is becoming familiar with the data, coding them and finding out the mutual teams to hear the voices of our participants and we write up papers or, or policy reports based on all this data. So the participants, because I'm looking at pharmacy and the space sector, the participants for pharmacy and space sector people, we managed to uh, interview a huge amount of people from all over the globe uh, in all sorts of sectors, uh, including policymakers and future pharmacists as well. So for the space sector, we even have um, space agency leads and private astronauts in this study. So this is a sneak peek of the results because it's not published um, and we will focus on medication management. So medication management um, uh, is one of the main teams that came up and then um, they wanted more medication optimization with medication used in space. Um, the second main team is of, is of course medication related research. There's tons and tons of uh, suggestions there, but the obvious one is looking into pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. So um, there is uh, also a need for awareness of health and medications in space. So we will just give an example. So just to give a little bit of brief definition, definition of medication management, um, so the idea of it is medication optimization focuses on the outcomes of the patient rather than the process of the system. And they both have the aim of making sure that we get maximum benefit from the medicines and minimizing potential harm. <clears throat> so medication uh, management is uh, in order to use medication safe and effectively occurs throughout the journey of the medicine. And uh, it's means that it starts from manufacturing, procurement, selection, prescribing, dispensing, sale or supply, patient use, as well as disposal. So past exploration is a small number of people, so it's quite easy to manage those. But if you're going for a deep space exploration or have more people in space tourism, we do really need to think how we're going to make medicines use safe and effective. How the data looks like, this is just a, an example. So medicines management, um, space travelers, Need, want it to be more patient centered. So want it to more be more space traveler centered. So um, this is from the space sector. So the person was uh, having a trip to, to, to space and the person was worried about the side effects of the anti-nausea medication and ended up not taking that. But the scientist who was bringing the person up to space were concerned about the rocket exploding or concerned about the participant dying rather than thinking about their comfort. So I think it's time that we shift into having more space traveler centered medication care and talk about what the patient also needs and not just about um, fatal incidences. So that's just an example of medication management. So we have a lot of them talking about medication review, because you know you don't know how the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamic works in the body, so whether current medication need to change in the context of space to prevent all sorts of uh, side effects or you know therapy failure. Uh, participants also wanted more information about drugs. Perhaps telepharmacy could work if we're going to colonize Mars and things like that. 
So that's just an example of how qualitative data looks like. And I know it's wordy, but I don't really expect you to read them all. So then we have another study from um, um, Virginia. So one of my very inspirational colleagues. So she looked into medication use and performance during space flight. So um, uh, we do. So what she did was she used uh, an application, uh, an iOS application called Dose Tracker. So it was designed to collect medication information relevant for researchers from volunteer astronauts. So she collected things like medication name, dose, uh, frequency, perceived efficacy, and side effects. So 24 astronauts was approved to, to do this study, but the study was cut short and only six were able to do that. And the reasons are um, because it takes, uh, the crew has so much to do and is, they wanted to avoid uh, an onerous task. Uh, and you know, the crew were able to take medicines without the flight surgeons, uh, without discussing with the flight surgeons. Over-the-counter medicines are rarely recorded, so it's very poorly documented and um, it's low priority back then due to resupply. But if you look at the top right graph, you can see that the previous mission seems to have a huge underreporting of medications use, whereas when we had the dose tracker, it was much, it, it was a lot higher. So we really don't know how medicines are being used in space. So these are other researchers uh, in the School of Pharmacy in Nottingham. So these are uh, with another of my colleague, Phil. So he's also uh, the manufacturing person uh, and the talk in the afternoon will be one of the PhD students talking about that. So I won't uh, cover cover that because she's going to cover it quite extensively after this. Also have other inspirational colleagues. So this is Lucia and Monica. So they try to combine pharmacology and biology to understand uh, how to improve wound healing in space. I also have a teammate who is Yulia. So she works in pharmacogenetic. And this study analyzes the benefits of pharmacogenetics on all the 78 drugs that are on the space station because you're going to get side effects. And if you could prevent that and you know pick the one that for that particular to personalize the medicine for that astronaut, that you can you're not going to have side effect on this. So maybe you can take this and prevent those adverse effects. So there is a it's a very interesting paper. So you can Google it and go and read it. Uh, and also, uh, I have other inspirational colleagues, which are Pierre and Audrey. So she is going to talk about it in the next talk. So I'm not going to um, also go into that and let her go because I know that I'm running out of time. And so just to wrap things up, um, all the work that we have done has informed the European Space Agency's um, space sign roadmap. So despite the decades of human space mission, there are known unknowns regarding pharmacological countermeasures that has not yet been satisfactorily resolved, and many of which center around the potential effects of space flight altered physiology on the handling and action of administered medication. So specifically, we do not yet know whether there are indeed alterations in pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics when medication are applied in space nor do we understand what the potential effects of drug interaction, drug nutrition in space travelers are. So the issue of safe and effective in-mission medication needs to be addressed. Other issues center on medication use, as we have seen. Uh, medication supply and resupply will be limited as distance from Earth increases. Additionally, current pharma pharmacological countermeasures must be re-evaluated both for suitability in mission scenarios and also updated as we have seen with the osteoporosis one as new terrestrial therapies are developed. We also need to think about new hazard like exposures to planetary dust will necessitate new countermeasures. So this is also a sneak peek. Uh, it's going to be published sometime this year as well. Oops. So Addressing the challenges with develop solutions that are relevant on Earth as well as in space or remote environments and developing new ways of delivering medication. So an example of that is pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics monitoring. Currently it's being done in the laboratory. So if we can find less invasive ways to measure circulating drug levels, 
it would be beneficial for many terrestrial populations and could even shift chronic monitoring to clean from to home from the clinical laboratory. So whatever we do now, we can help what's happening on Earth as well. So the future of um, pharmacy is a lot. I've just listed a couple of things here, but actually it's limitless and for you to discover. So maybe you could be the first, I don't know, astropharmacist or whatever you want to be. So can, come join me. Uh, the answer is not straightforward. So, but let's join our brains to find fun funding and do something very, very uh, interesting. I think it's like an amazing dream, you know, and the science could be adapted and further developed to make this happen. So special thanks to uh, Inosa for having me here, uh, all the academics and scientists that support me, uh, UK Space Agency and the European Space Agency as the funding, as the study was funded by the UK Space Agency. So. Uh, thank you. My email is on the bottom right and uh, I'll, I look forward to your question and I hope I didn't uh, overload you with too much information. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leisha, for your amazing presentation. That was a lot of information for everyone, but um, I put the presentation on the website so um, everyone can go um, look at it um, and yeah ask her questions because we have her here i think it was a really amazing overview we were able to learn about um the different things done in pharmacology how it's really benefiting us here on earth and you've introduced a lot um, a lot of different um things that are being done and to the actual researchers and the teams so if you're interested in those um people um you can contact Li Shen and also um find them on their website social media and stuff so that you can actually um engage with them so thank you so much. So next, I'd like to introduce you to Audrey, Audrey De Robert Major. I'm so sorry, <laughs> she's going to pronounce her last name much better than me. So to introduce her, um, Audrey specializes in pharmacology to understand the effects of these extreme conditions on the human organisms and on drugs, and eventually to develop countermeasures. And in addition to her clinical activity in pharmacology unit, um, she takes part in um, Dr. Pierre um, Boutouir's research work um, that I think she will mention as well. And there, there's so many things I can explain to you about her, but I think um, she has it ready. So I will give the floor to Audrey now. Okay, thank you. So I just share my screen. And um, if you have any questions to Lishan or um, Audrey, please make sure to write it in the chat. I see a few questions coming in and we'll definitely answer them at the Q&A at the end. Okay, I give the floor to you now, Audrey. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Azuki, and thank you, Li Chin, for your great presentation. It's a very great pleasure to be here and to present my research work. So my name is Audrey and I am a pharmacist uh, resident following the specialization degrees in pharmaceutical innovation and research at the Hospital Européen Georges Pompidou in Paris. And in addition to my clinical activity, I am currently pursuing my master's degrees research uh, in uh, the assessment of cardiovascular, cardiovascular uh, drug during a long-term space flight and I will start my PhD on September. So today, uh, the team uh, uh, in which I'm working with, led by Professor Pierre Boutouri, is uh, specialized in uh, clinical cardiovascular pharmacology and in, early, and in vascular aging. And uh, this team has been involved in many space project research since the 19th and since today. Our research team uh, belongs to the Department of Space of the University of Paris, and uh, we continue our involvement uh, about uh, pharma space pharmacology and uh, the cardiovascular uh, consequences um, the, of uh, the long-term space flight around projects like this one. So today I want to give you some context for uh, cardiovascular physiology in space and also about space pharmacology challenges in order to develop new uh, pharmacology countermeasures. 
Indeed, during long-term space, fli uh, space flight uh, over uh, six months, uh, microgravity leads to cardiovascular deconditioning involving a profound uh, modification of the body composition and uh, its metabolism in space. We have realized that there is a cardiac and arterial remodeling as early vascular aging occurs like this. If you smoke, are overweight or too stressed, have an unhealthy diet, high blood pressure, diabetes or high cholesterol, it's likely your arteries will age faster than you. This process is called vascular aging, meaning your arteries are not necessarily the same age as you are. They may be older. And this premature vascular aging process starts in early life. As you age, the arteries lose their elasticity and become stiffer. The arterial walls become inflamed and accumulate fat and calcium. It is a silent process, but when it reaches a critical level, it's already too late. Dramatic consequences may occur, such as a heart attack, heart failure, kidney failure, or a stroke. So after this demonstration, you can see on this graph that there is a significantly increase of arterial stiffness post-flight compared with a pre-flight baseline in astronauts, similar to more than 20 years of normal aging. Astronauts also showed, uh, in parallel, sign of development of insulin resistance during the, their uh, six-month spaceflight. We also have obtained uh, similar results during our uh, last bed rest campaign in MEDES, the Institute of Space Medicine and Physiology in France. So bed rest is a, a simulation on Earth of classical uh, gravity, where healthy subjects spend up uh, two months in a six degree head down. And here, the, uh, the healthy subjects uh, uh, shows uh, showed after uh, two months of prolonged bed uh, an excessive uh, uh, aging of 11 years and after one month of uh, recovery um, they don't they didn't fully recover their arterial properties with uh, an equivalent of seven seven years of aging so in this context, Pharmacology in space is needed because there is a profound modification of body in space and this can affect the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of the drug. Furthermore, uh, we have uh, this acute uh, problem with early vascular aging that is not solved at all and there is no pharmacological countermeasures and um, the daily physical activities and the dietary uh, measures uh, seems neither to be sufficient nor effective. Thus, we are faced with older astronauts, uh, and it represents a potential long-term risk exposing to heart diseases that uh, which will have to be managed locally. However, to date, uh, to date, few pharmacological studies has been um, performed in space possibly due to the logistical and the technical constraints of sample biologic fluids, that is to say the sample management, the difficulties of dosage, the drug stability, as Lichin says, uh, the control of the drug intake, and moreover, analysis on board is not feasible yet. So consequently, our research team uh, wishes to develop new methodologies for uh, pharmacology studies and to study new methods focused on uh, the cardiovascular function because it's our area of expertise with the aim to define a strategy for pharmacological countermeasures. So here, what we do at the hospital is uh, the drug um, adherence assessment. So, uh, every patient is uh, supposedly uh, is supposed to take his drugs, and when uh, and during their consultation, we ask them to give uh, their urine, and then uh, we analyze uh, the urine at the laboratory for a medication detection with a method of liquid chromatography mass spectrometer. And the question, the idea here was how to adapt uh, the sensitive uh, method to space requirements. 
And uh, this question was the main topic of my master's research project. So we said the hypothesis that innovative dried matrix, matrix spot technique use dry urine spot for urine and dry blood spot for blood applied to drug dosage coupled with liquid chromatography mass spectrometer could be an alternative method for space pharmacology. Well, a dry blood spot is a minimally invasive procedure uh, consisting to take a draw, uh, uh, to, to draw a drop of blood from the finger. It is also called a finger prick test. And using this method, 5 to 30 microliters of blood from the fingertip can direct, uh, directly uh, spotted on the filter paper. As for dry urine spot, uh, 20 microliters of urine can be directly, uh, directly spotted with a vol uh, volumetric piper transfer on the filter paper card. Then uh, they are allowed to uh, dry uh, in a, at room temperature during one hour, and they can be stored in a sealed plastic bag until the analysis. For the analysis, dry blood spot and dry, your sp uh, dry urine spot uh, are punched out, extracted, then injected in the liquid chromatography mass spectrometer for quantitative analysis. So during my master research, I have developed and validated five cardiovascular drug detections. And now my PhD is starting with the objective to apply this technique of the dry matrix spot to home sampling for the assessment of drug adherence and to astronauts for future pharmacological studies in aging. So there are some uh, many advantages of dry matrix spot as uh, they are easy and fast collection. They can be collected by non-professional healthcare. It's very safe at lower risk. Uh, it's resistant to stress. It um, uh, uh, requires very small volume of biological fruits. It's very hard to repeat it by biological fruit sampling at a very low cost. But nevertheless, uh, to be honest, there are some limits. Not all drugs are detectable according to their chemical properties, and this uh, requires a long development for each compound to be detected. So now, our, um, uh, the next steps are to conduct pharmacology uh, studies to test uh, these dry matrix spots on ground analogs through true projects, COSMOS, standing for cardiovascular monitoring and pharmacology on Mars, and PSK for pharmacology space kit. So the first study is to evaluate the safe management of samples in isolation through Cosmos at Mars Desert Research Station in the desert of Utah. The second study is to test the microfluidics in microgravity through PSK uh, during a parabolic flight. And uh, the third experiment is to study the changes in drug metabolism induced by microgravity through PSK during a campaign bed rest. So now to uh, get back to uh, the Cosmos uh, project, our uh, research team uh, was very lucky to be selected to conduct uh, the, the project next December at the MDRS station. So here is uh, the crew that uh, will uh, perform our uh, experiment at uh, MDRS station. They will be uh, isolating in uh, simulating a, human, a possible human settlement on Mars. And uh, our first experiment is PASCAL, a screening study of caffeine and metabolites in blood and urine. As you know, caffeine is a natural psychoactive substance naturally present in the coffee. Moreover, spatial environment may alter the drug metabolism and its re uh, response. And as we said before, today, no terrestrial simulation model has yet been validated for the pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamic study under space condition. Furthermore, cyto cytochromes are critical enzymes for drug metabolism, and they are playing a major role of the, via the viability of drug disposal in the body, especially cytochrome 1A2, which is a well-known metabolic pathway involved in elimination of common drugs as lidocaine, anesthesia, melatonin uh, for insomnia, and caffeine for sleepiness. And as Lichin showed us uh, previously, all these drugs are included in the ISS medical kit. 
So the first objective is to evaluate the feasibility of the blood and urine collection for dry blood spots and dry, dry urine spots. The first objective is to propose a unique pharmacokinetics exploration using coffee as a probe. And the third objective is to have a functional picture of a main metabolic pathway and their modification during the study. So there will be a three a time sampling before, during, and after the mission. A dry burst a blood spot will be collected before the coffee intake and after two, three, and six hours. And dry urine, sp uh, dry urine spot uh, will be collected over uh, 24 hours. Uh, all sam samples will be stored at the MDR at MDRS station um, at room temperature in the dark, and they will be mailed at our lab for this uh, analysis, which is part of uh, the validation. We also take the opportunity to do a cardiovascular follow-up of the crew members through the experiments mass early vascular aging monitoring. We will measure their early vascular, uh, their vascular aging uh, with two uh, innovative medical devices, which is the pop meter and uh, the connected balance uh, with things. We will also um, access the body composi uh, composition of the, um, of the crew participants. And these two medical devices are uh, very innovative, ergonomic, compact, and very uh, easy to use. So now to conclude, um, cardiovascular health is essential for astronauts for fulfilling missions and for their future life. And investment in main space missions require optimal drug safety for fully operational astronauts. And through these two projects, COSMOS and PSK, it will make possible to one, test technologies and procedures for early vascular aging in extreme environments, two, to establish rigorous protocols for handling and storing human Martian biological samples before returning to Earth for analysis, and then to test a unique smart support, multifunctional, easy to transport and economical, the dry matrix, with a final objective to improve the comfort of astronauts and astronauts. So through all these ground analog uh, uh, facilities, uh, this context provides a unique research environment to validate new technologies and to define new control strategies. So now my first objective is that this project uh, become a reality and that the proposed technique, uh, the dry matrix uh, spot can be convincing and very useful for uh, uh, further uh, pharmacology study and also for the health of the astronauts. And uh, furthermore, my second objective is that during my PhD thesis, uh, in order to go further in that field, uh, I would like to collaborate with uh, other medical space uh, structures that will be interested in our uh, experiments and also to widen my field of competence. So uh, thank you a lot for, for your listening and I will uh, turn back over uh, the discussion over to Azuki. Thank you. Thank you so much, Audrey, for an inspiring and really interesting presentation. I think we saw a lot of different things that can be done in hypergravity, microgravity. Um, I really like the caffeine one because I'm a big fan of coffee. So uh, all the things that you do are really interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. I see a lot of questions coming in. So I think I'd like to move on to the Q&A now. Um, before we dive in, um, please make sure to answer the questionnaire before you leave because we really want to hear um, your feedback on this. And if you have any more questions to both Lishan yeah. and Audrey, keep sending them in because, um, yeah, this is your time to answer, uh, um, to ask them. So the first question um, was from Madhavan. Um, his question was about the medicine. So when they go bad, are they disposed in space or are they taken back to Earth for future studies? So maybe, um, Lishan, you can um, ex help us um, yeah, elaborate more on what the medicine, um, how the medicine is treated after um, it, it goes bad or um, after the studies that are held um, in the ISS or other places. 
not sure it is brought back down for now. Yeah, so so they just, you know, they have that medication kit. So after they, um, I mean, they just keep it there and then just bring it, bring it back down. Okay, perfect. Thank you. The next question was also from one of us. Um, I, um, he actually posted a link on the chat about DARPA, the D Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency in the U.S., um, inaugurating a program about exoskeletons for human performance augmentation. And he wanted to know what you thought about exoskeletons and if, if you're aware of the project, what you thought of the project as a whole. So maybe if you have any, um, any thoughts on the exoskeleton or the DARPA program. Um, so I know that DAPRA uses the exoskeleton to sort of make soldiers stronger. So I'm not so clear about what else they do with that. But I do know that um, ESA has an exoskeleton uh, project as well. And they, um, they what, what that exoskeleton is for is more for doing things remotely. So you could be outside the, the International Space Station and controlling a robot to, to do stuff. So I do think that um, there is potential. Um, mm, I think the remote one is particularly good, but you know, if you think about being on, I don't know, other planets with low microgravity, maybe if your bones are not strong enough, you don't need, you think that you can adapt with an exoskeleton. I think that that could be a, a way forward to do something, but I think that's much more further around, mm -hmm. further down the, 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 the road, but I mean, it, if, it, it it's quite interesting to think, you know, if your bones get slushy, so what can you do? You can use an exoskeleton and, and do stuff, mm -hmm. you know, Gundam style robot fighting. I don't know. <laughs> but I do think there, there is um, potential. Yes, maybe it can help uh, for a uh, certain task uh, to to be to that be easier to I don't know to build a new architecture or on the moon or I don't know. <laughs> Thank you so much for the answer. Um, the next question was from Rowena. Um, thinking about how penicillin was discovered, does Li Shan think that there will be scope for growing antibiotics, for instance, in space, on the moon, Mars, or through genetic modification or other life forms, for example, plants? Uh, yeah, so I definitely think there is room for um, growing antibiotics biotics or because the bacteria in space get stronger so there is a very good um, testing point to to test uh, antibiotics for resistance and things like that um, and growing them from plants I think that's definitely a, a, a possibility because they are already starting to grow um, osteoporosis medicine using lettuce already so they've uh, already have a proof of concept using lettuce and a teriperitide. So yeah, I think that there is a possibility and um, bacteria and viruses are a big thing because your immunity goes down and the bacteria get stronger and more resistant and grow faster. So it is a, a up and coming hot, a very hot topic and there's a lot of work being done. So yes, definitely potential a lot. Thank you. Um, Audrey, um, was there yeah. anything you wanted to add to this? Uh, no, I don't know really about this experiment, but I think yeah, there is a lot of to do to produce, um, I think, um, uh, drugs uh, in microgravity and why not with uh, vegetables? Perfect. Thank you. The next question was from Zoe. Um, you mentioned a high rate of use of medications for skin condition. Is that due to pre-costing pre conditions or do skin conditions commonly develop in space? Uh, I missed the first word, was that pre-costing? Pre-costing, um, pre-costing. Oh. Um, I guess it's if it's conditions that that person already has or do the skin conditions commonly develop in space? Um, well, this because of the... So he says pre-existing, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, pre... I, so I think because of the confidential 
uh, confidentiality issues with the astronauts. Um, it's not really clear whether it's pre-existing, but I do think that there are a lot of aggravating factors in space. So um, firstly, your immune system changes, and that's quite a lot of reason why you get hypersensitivities and uh, skin conditions. I also think that the environment in space is quite hostile, so humidity is also different, and there are a lot the of... Radiation also. Yes. Yeah, sorry, so sorry. is the radiation also, yes. Mm -hmm. Can be, yeah, uh, so, mm -hmm. I, I think there's also one in a, a famous case where they uh, they went to the, the moon dust also creates allergies. So, yeah, we don't know what are the allergens. OK, thank you so much. The last question, I think it's already been answered in the chat, but I will send it to you, Audrey. Mm -hmm. It was asking about the dried urine in your presentation so uh, how how is yeah. urine dried yes. or yeah yeah so just dry your in spots uh, you consisted just to put a some very uh, small amount of urine on the paper as 20 microliters then uh, it's a lot to uh, to dry uh, at uh, room temperature and it can be, uh, be stored during a long time. And after we can make a dosage uh, one month, two months, six months later. Really? And can, <laughs> yes. And it's the same for the blood too. Thank you so much. Really interesting stuff. Okay. So I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Anjali Gupta and give her the floor. And before I do that, I'd like to give you a little overview of Dr. Anjali. So Dr. Anjali Gupta is part of the business development team at Axiom Space, where she's leading life science efforts for in-space research and manufacturing. Dr. Gupta began her career in pharmaceutical industry in 1998 at Roche, where she conducted early stage drug discovery research as an electrophysiologist developed assays for high throughput drug screening, and later at Pfizer, established novel protocols for small molecule safety pharmacological assessments. So um, I, I believe Anjali could explain herself much better than I can, so I'm going to give the floor to Dr. Anjali Gupta. Thank you, Hasuki, for that wonderful introduction. I really appreciate it. Let me share my slides. Right. Thank you for bearing with me on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Hasuki, for that um, wonderful introduction. Um, I'd like to first start out by thanking um, the UN Office of Outer Space Affairs and ASGSR for this invitation to speak in this forum. It's truly an honor to be here, and today I will share some insights into microgravity research and how space can be a platform for drug discovery innovation. I will also introduce you to Axiom Space if you're not already familiar with the first commercial space station launching into orbit. Let's see. Let's begin with the pharmaceutical drug discovery process. This is something I learned in my first job at Roche Pharmaceuticals back in 1998. At that time, the drug discovery process was primarily target, was target based drug discovery. Once a therapeutic area was identified, to work on. A target was then identified, validated, and selected. So for example, we worked on the central nervous system diseases such as pain. We identified T-type calcium channels as a target. Once that target was validated, we developed a high throughput screening assay to screen against a library of millions of compounds. From the drug screen, we identified a chemical lead series. From that, the lead series was validated and optimized which involved a back and forth between electrophysiologists like myself and medicinal chemists. Subsequently, the process moved into preclinical assessment, which involved safety pharmacology, especially cardiovascular. And if the compound were to move further, it would undergo ADME, which is absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion, and DMPK, drug metabolism and pharmacokinetics, and GLP talk studies. If the results met expectations, the compound would move into formulation and API, which is active pharmaceutical ingredient production for clinical studies. This process for drug development is long, complex, expensive, uncertain, and leads to high attrition rates for drug failures. So the question is, you know, what is the cause of these failures? Pharmaceutical drugs 
have a um, have a very high failure rate. Um, that means that after spending five years narrowing down key medicinal compounds for a particular disease target, only 10% of the selected compounds that enter clinical trials will advance to FDA approval, as you can see in this figure. So again, the question is, what is the why is this um, attrition rate so high? A study conducted on drug attrition rates analyzed data for AstraZeneca, Eli Lilly, Galaxo, and Pfizer for, for drugs that move that failed to move beyond the clinical trial. As you can see here, the data are shown. The analysis showed that safety and toxicology were the largest sources of drug failure. Another study analyzed 218 drug failures between 2013 and 2015 and found that efficacy and safety were the reasons for drug failure. Drug development is a highly regulated, lengthy, and costly process. So what are the options for, mitigation the, for, for mitigating these risks? What are some innovations in pharmaceutical drug discovery to address these issues? Well, with the advent of molecular biology and the Human Genome Project in the 1990s, there was a historic shift towards target-based drug development. Target-based drug development relies on prior knowledge of diseases and disease mechanisms and targets before development can begin. Whereas phenotypic drug discovery is based on disease models and complements target-based drug discovery. Other advances in drug development include stem cell technologies. Advances in stem cell technologies, as you can see here, such as human-induced pluripotent stem cells, are being utilized for drug discovery. In this figure, you can see that iPSCs are being used for bioengineering, for producing organoid cultures, which are then used for drug screening. Stem cells can also be used for disease modeling and cell therapy. Other innovations in drug discovery include in silico methods. There are approximately 22,000 genes in the human genome. This figure on the left here shows how, how the 22,000 genes break down. It's interesting to note that only 3,000 genes are druggable with small molecules. Artificial intelligence and machine learning are now being applied to conduct in silico drug screening for the, next, for the other 10,000 or so hard to drug or what's commonly known as undruggable protein targets. Clearly, drug discovery and development is a complex process. I like this figure because it describes this complexity very well. Finding the right lock and key combination is hard, and it's even harder when there are additional conditions to consider, such as safety, efficacy, dosage. So the, now the question is, how can space and microgravity support pharmaceutical drug discovery and development? So let's begin with a brief overview of the space environment. In the last 20 years of continuous human presence on the ISS in low Earth orbit, we have learned that LEO offers a unique environment with reason, within reasonable grasp. The space environment is characterized by space radiation, extreme temperatures, near complete vacuum, and microgravity, also known as weightlessness. For the purpose of this talk, I will primarily focus on microgravity. Microgravity is essentially weightlessness that results inside a free-falling spacecraft traveling at 17,500 miles per hour, as you can see on the bottom left, while gravity pulls it down towards Earth. As a result of weightlessness, gravity-driven movement of fluid due to temperature gradients and density differences are eliminated. There are no more gravity-driven convection currents. There is no sedimentation and surface tension dominates. Levitation enables processing of materials without a container. Experiments in microgravity have unveiled novel insights into physical and biological science phenomena. So how can we leverage these insights for pharmaceutical drug discovery and manufacturing? It has been observed that humans in space experience cardiovascular deconditioning, bone loss, muscle atrophy, and display an aging phenotype. There are some physiological changes that are observed in astronauts that seem to mimic certain disease and aging pathologies, and they occur at an accelerated rate in microgravity. Interestingly, majority of these changes reverse upon return to the ground. 
Thus, it seems reasonable to explore whether disease modeling can be accelerated in orbit and applied towards drug discovery on the ground. Animal models are commonly, commonly used in drug discovery and development to understand disease mechanisms, identify and validate drug targets, and make preliminary assessments on drug safety and efficacy. Despite the advantages of rodent models on Earth, diseases that affect bones and muscles, such as osteoporosis and muscle atrophy, can be difficult to model in Earth-bound rodents because effects of gravity are ever-present. The ability to work in microgravity presents a perfect opportunity to improve the preclinical testing of osteoporosis drugs. This is exactly what Amgen did to test the efficacy of its osteoporosis drugs, Prolia and Avenity. On Earth, it is very difficult, if not impossible, to control for differences in animal subjects' activity level that may contribute to differences in bone mass. In a microgravity environment, this variable is removed. Disease states can be modeled in cells and tissues as well, not just whole animals. Recent progress in tissue engineering has led to increasingly complex approaches to investigate human diseases in vitro. The aim is to provide more functional and physiological models to study the pathogenesis of disease and to identify novel diagnostic biomarkers and therapeutic targets. Induced pluripotent stem cells derived um, cell-derived organoids represent a novel class of in vitro 3D models for recapitulating the structure and the complexity of the tissues. These organoids provide an option for mimicking the patient's disease features in a dish. There are distinct advantages of doing this in microgravity. Early research indicates, as you can see here on the far left, that stem cells self-renew symmetrically in space. This can lend to stem cell expansion and manufacturing in space at a much greater capacity than on Earth. With regards to organoids and 3D bioprinting, due to lack of gravity, there is no sedimentation. Structures maintain their three-dimensional form wherever they're deposited. This also elimin eliminates the risk of organ or tissue collapse, enables organ growth without scaffolds, and also allows for use of lower viscosity inks. Another interesting way to model disease is via use of microphysiological devices, also known as tissue chips. These are microfluidic devices that are lined with bioengineered human organs and tissues. They can be used for screening drugs in a physiologically relevant manner. These devices are miniaturized, automated, and personalized, lending them to use in orbit. Early studies with tissue chips in space have focused on cardiac dysfunction, sarcopenia, and, and immunosenescence. The figure on the right shows a bit more detail on how experimental conditions can be varied on the tissue chips. For example, mechanical cues, biochemical cues, and cellular cues can be manipulated based on how the chamber is designed. Microgravity has demonstrated to be a great environment for protein crystal growth. Protein crystallization is an essential step to obtaining the 3D structure of a protein, for example. That 3D protein structure is then used to develop better chemical entities against that protein target for drug discovery. So again, in a microgravity environment, lack of buoyancy-driven convection currents, lack of sedimentation, and slower, more uniform diffusion diffusion-driven movement of molecules into a crystal lattice during crystallization in the microgravity environment results in larger, more well-ordered crystals that have higher diffusion, that have a higher diffraction resolution and lower mosaicity. Crystallization of organic molecules can lead to significant improvements in structure-based drug design, as well as formulation, manufacturing, and storage of biologics. I want to touch on this a little bit more uh, with respect to protein crystal applications for biological formulation. Currently, protein-based therapeutics, such as monoclonal antibodies, are formulated as a fluid suspension and administered via injection, typically intravenously or subcutaneously. The so growing uniform protein crystals on orbit can aid in reformulating biologic drug de delivery, which can then ultimately lead to time and cost savings. 
Another application of microgravity to pharmaceutical drug development is the, fin is the final manufacturing of the drug product. Flow chemistry in space can enable complex chemical reactions that may otherwise be too difficult to achieve on Earth. In addition, API manufacturing and now high potency API manufacturing, and again, API is active pharmaceutical ingredient, is a highly toxic and dangerous process with major environmental impacts. Offshoring manufacturing off the planet to space will mitigate both risks. It is interesting to note that pharmaceutical companies have been leveraging the microgravity platform for innovative drug development. As you can see, here is a list of a few of those companies. Amgen, as I mentioned, used space to test the efficacy of its osteoporosis drugs. Prolia blocks bone resorption. Avenity promotes bone formation. Eli Lilly is using the orbital platform to study lyophilization, which is essentially freeze drying. Lyophilization is a common method for formulating pharmaceutical drug products with improved chemical and physical stability. Sanofi is studying the effects of microgravity on the immune system. Novartis conducted a research study on muscle atrophy and interestingly found that the study indicated a unique mechanism for space-induced muscle atrophy compared to ground studies. AstraZeneca is using the ISS to study nanoparticle formation in orbit with the goal of optimizing manufacturing processes for drug delivery. Mark has been using PCG for, key, for Keytruda for quite some time, and their recent publication indicates promising results towards improvement in the manufacture, storage, and delivery of the drug. This would certainly result in reduced costs and improved patient quality of life. And finally, BMS is also using the National Lab to study protein crystallization in the hopes of enhancing biologics development and manufacturing. So far, I've provided you with a broad overview of drug discovery and how the microgravity space environment can be leveraged for drug discovery innovation. This slide summarizes some of those ideas. Essentially, studies in microgravity can be accelerated um, for pharmaceutical drug discovery and development by accelerating disease modeling, providing less invasive diseases for um, bone and muscle diseases, as well as for age-related diseases. The environment is conducive to physiological model systems to interrogate mechanisms of action, screen drugs, and conduct proof of concept studies. For lead discovery, protein crystal st structure can certainly enhance drug design. And for preclinical pre work in space, um, that includes medicinal chemistry, API manufacturing, and drug for reformulation. And this is by no means a comprehensive list, but just a general broad overview. Next, I'd like to take a moment to show you how research in space differs compared to Earth what the space lab looks like and what equipment is available in space for research. As you can see here, this is a, a very simple comparison of an Earth lab compared to a space lab. A space lab has basically benches on all four sides because there is no directionality in space. Here, I want to point out that all experimental hardware on the ISS is contained within these express racks. That's astronaut Scott Kelly on the left, at the microgravity science glove box and astronaut Terry Burtz at the life science glove box on the right. One is working off of the ceiling here and one is working what would be a traditional lab bench. And again, there is no directionality, so they can work in any which direction. <clears throat> Shown here is a cell culture system in an automated format. So if you wanna do cell culture in space, um, there's an option to do this in an automated format where all cells, media, temperature control, and materials are preloaded into a small shoebox size cube and then flown to the ISS. And you can see the behind the scene pro scenes processes on the upper two right pictures. And then in the middle is the box that's completely contained and flown to the ISS. Cell culture can also be done manually in space. And here on the left, astronaut Peggy Whitson is changing out the media. Um, using a biocell and syringes. So on one side, she's pulling up old media and then she'll take the syringe and push in new media to change um, the cell culture media. And on the right, you have astronaut Kate, um, Kate Rubens 
who is looking at a six well uh, petri dish equivalent um, of, of cells plated in a uh, biocell. Other lab equipment in space includes, interestingly, a um, min-ion, which, um, which allows for DNA sequencing as well as RNA sequencing. Um, in the center on the top, you see a mini PCR machine. On the bottom left is a um, thermocycler, also known as a PCR machine. And then on the right, um, we have astronaut Peggy Woodson, who's working at the hood. Uh, and then the bottom right is a fridge. This is a um, freezer, refrigerator, incubator device for galleon experimentation. So cool acronyms. And as I mentioned, we do do experiments in space. Um, here is an example of a rodent habitat and how those rodent rodents would be housed on orbit. On the top right is a bone densitometer um, developed by a company called TechShot. And then on the bottom is a Drosophila module. And I just want to show you this um, image of a mouse in weightlessness um, who's enjoying his or her solitude in space um, in that weightless environment. Uh, here, I'd like to point out controls. In any experiment, uh, in any research, your results are only as good as your controls. In spaceflight research, you have to rethink and think about your controls from multiple angles. For example, you have to think about gravity controls. Here, you need to account for those gravity transitions. On the ground, you have 1G during a rocket launch, it's 3G or higher. And then once you get into onto the space station, it's essentially 0G. Um, then also, you need to consider technical ground controls, which may include running an experiment in your own lab compared to or in parallel to using a NASA lab facility or, or a um, space agency facility as a staging area. So all of these can introduce um, some level of error and that needs to be accounted for. Here, I want to point out to you that it's not just the main discovery research efforts that benefit from space studies, it's also the ancillary activities related to spaceflight experiments that reap ben benefits. It's interesting to note that building for spaceflight results in notable benefits. For example, when building for space, terrestrial experiments, your lab bench on Earth, will need to be translated and automated on Earth. And then once it's automated on Earth, you can automate it for, for, for space, and then you can scale up that process. So if you think about this, um, this really pushes the boundaries of innovation for product and um, process development. So some of the key features that I've noted here are, um, as you're building for space, you're miniaturizing, you're ruggedizing your product, you're automating it, you're considering lighter weight material, perhaps even refining those materials, and you're revising the microfluidics. And the result um, in terms of benefits from these features is a smaller footprint, perhaps, or a lower cost product, um, greater accessibility, ease of use, mobility, and potentially new markets and new uses on the ground. Uh, while you're building for space, you may now use the same technology to take these into re extreme environments, such as the desert, ocean, mountain, Arctic, and again, remote areas, or under-resourced in rural communities. And you can even maybe apply this to STEM or do-it-yourself type projects. Um, next, briefly, I'd like to take a few moments to introduce you to Axiom Space. As you may already know, space stations have been around for nearly 50 years, since 1973, beginning with Skylab, which aimed to understand how humans might live in space. Then came the Russian Mir in 1986, followed by the International Space Station in 1998. After 20 years and more than 3,000 experiments, the ISS is reaching its end of life and will begin retiring soon. So what does this mean for humanity's continuous presence in space over the last 20 years? Well, Axiom was born out of this necessity. As a company, our vision is to build a thriving home in space that benefits every human everywhere. Our mission is to improve life on Earth and foster possibilities beyond it by building and operating the world's first commercial space station. In this brief video, I'd like to give you a perspective on what the Axiom station will look like. As you can see here, Axiom Module 1 arrives and attaches to Node 2 
of the forward port of the ISS. The Canada arm then will reposition the Earth Observatory to the nadir. The habitat module arrives next and is being grabbed by the Canada arm. And you'll see on the back side of this module, there will be an Axiom robotic arm as well. The research and manufacturing facility will fly in next. I want to take this moment to share with you that each of these modules is basically an independent spacecraft. Each module has its own propulsion and navigation system. The modules will be launched on a launch carrier and then deployed into low Earth orbit, and they will eventually find their way to the ISS. Next you see here is the power and thermal tower module, which will fly in last, and this will take up 100 kilowatts of power. This module flies in a folded configuration, and then once it's attached, the solar arrays will deploy, revealing the airlock, that little hole right there, uh, that will support extravehicular activity work. The space station is modular in design. Each module is expected to be at about 80 cubic meters. In terms of the timeline, the first module will take flight in 2024. So in just um, about three, three and a half years, the final module will arrive in 2028. Axiom Station will eventually separate from the ISS and become a free flyer, as you can see here. And you can see that the pedals on the Earth Observatory just opened up. So shown here is a rendering of that Axiom Earth Observatory. This is expected to accommodate six individuals at, an, at a given time. Um, the foldable petals will serve as a shield against space radiation and solar particle events. For the Axiom habitat, we've moved into an eight-sided configuration compared to the four-sided four that you see on the bottom left. This is so that we can optimize the use of volume in the module. And this is a photo of the Axiom crew quarters. This posh habitat has been designed by the renowned French architect, Philippe Stark. The company itself was founded by, uh, founded in 2016 by Dr. Cam Gaffarian and, and Mr. Mike Sofferdini. Mike Sofferdini was the former ISS program manager for 10 years from 2005 to 2015. The Axiom leadership team has been involved in every ISS mission since the inception of the program. And we have experienced astronauts on the team who bring a deep and longstanding expertise to human spaceflight. In terms of our business models, um, Axiom Space supports diverse global market segments. We provide human space flight for professional, sovereign, and private astronauts with 10, 30, 60, 90, and 100 day missions, training, mission planning, and management. Our on orbit services include research and in space manufacturing, as well as brand and media partnerships, which enable um, some compelling storytelling. And then finally, we provide a near Earth platform for science in preparation for Moon and Mars, a platform for technology demonstration and many maturations. And it's also a home, a home for human performance studies for deep space missions. Earlier this year, we announced and revealed our first private crew to visit the ISS. On this historic mission, astronaut Hall of Famer uh, Michael Lopez Allegra will command a flight to the ISS to fly three private astronauts. Axiom AX2 mission will be planned for Q3 of 2022 and Axiom 3 mission for 2023. Axiom is also um, providing on orbit services for research and manufacturing. Our modules will be equipped with state of the tart state of the art technology. In terms of major themes, of course, it'll be grounded in STEM education for both fundamental and applied research. In addition, we'll offer exploration support, tech development, commercial R&D, and on-orbit manufacturing. One thing to point out is that the station design is modular, and I've mentioned that before. Thus, we can implement multiple research and manufacturing modules. Each can be dedicated to a particular process, for example. For, so, for example, I'd mentioned API production. Uh, because it's so toxic, you can imagine that there can be an entire facility dedicated to active pharmaceutical in ingredient production in space. And these modules will be fully autonomous. 
Finally, with respect to deep space exploration, Axiom Space will be the base camp for the world's space exploration ex initiatives. And I've already mentioned this before, where um, Axiom will serve as a near Earth platform for tech demonstrations, as well as long duration in situ astronaut training and testing. So I've covered quite a bit here, and this is only a tiny flavor of what's possible in space. We are at an exciting point in humanity's timeline of history. In the past five years or so, there has been a growing movement towards the birth of new space, which is characterized by a democratization of space, meaning that access to space is open to anyone. This means that space is an opportunity for innovation, for invention and for entrepreneurship. Scientists are innovators and inventors. You can go just a bit further and become an entrepreneur by commercializing your idea. And if you need a little nudge, Axiom Space is sponsoring a scholarship. With the scholarship, our message is that space is for everyone. If you're wondering, how can I touch space? This is your opportunity. If you're a college or a graduate student and a citizen of this planet, then consider applying. The question that we're asking you to answer is, how would you use the space environment to change the world, both on Earth or beyond Earth? If you're a professor, please tell your students about this scholarship, scholarship competition. More information can be found on axiomspace.com slash stars, and the applications are due by June 30th of this year. Finally, I, I want to remind you that the future is here. And I want to share my own little journey, journey to this future. In 1990, I was a first year college student working in a genetics lab. That is the same year when the Human Genome Project was launched. 10 years later in 2000, the first draft of the human genome was published. And 10 years after that, the omics field took off and gene ed editing became easy and routine. So those are highlighted in the green text right there. Somewhat in parallel in the orange text, in 1995, the internet was born. 15 years later, I was doing digital health research at a time when the population was starting to carry high powered computing devices connected to all the world's knowledge in their pockets. Also in parallel, highlighted in blue here, around the year 2000, the ISS was being built and the secrets of the space environment were being discovered through research. It's only recently when the first reusable rocket became available and it's only within the last year when widespread investment in space is increasing. So if you're just coming to the space world, you're not too late. We at Axiom will be launching the first private astronaut mission to the ISS next year. And just two years after that, the first module of the first commercial space station. And the second thing that I wanna remind you is that technology advances at an exponential rate. So pause for a moment and, and consider this. Can you imagine your lives, our planet, our solar system 30 years from now? Many of you are just embarking on your own career and college journeys like I was in 1990. What will it look like for you in 30 years? What part will you play? What impact will you make? I'd like to thank the United Nations Office of Outer Space, Outer Space Affairs for this opportunity. I've made an attempt to map UN Sustainable Development Goals to biotech and pharma in space. And I believe we're doing pretty well. And I am confident that one day we will be able to hit all 17 of the Sustainable Development Goals for space, um, for biotech and pharma in space. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Angela, for this really inspiring presentation. I think it was a wonderful introduction to the R&D done in the pharmaceutical field. I think it was very interesting that um, you pointed out the notable studies done by various companies, um, which was very new to us, and also various examples and tools that are being used, and a lot of exciting things happening at Axiom Space. So I really look forward to um, the activities. Okay, next I'd like to introduce our student speaker, Tej.
So Tej is a second year PhD student at the University of Nottingham in the UK. Her project falls into the theme of astromedicine and astropharmacy, looking at drug manufacturing and delivery in space. So I will give the floor to you, Tej. Thank you, Zuki. I'm just about to share my presentation. While Tej is sharing, um, if you have any questions, please make sure to put it in the chat. Um, maybe it's my chat that's frozen, but I don't see many questions at the moment. So if you have any, please um, keep shooting them to us. Thank you. OK. So hopefully you can see my slides all right. Yeah, it looks perfect. Amazing, thank you. Um, so thanks very much for the introduction um, to Zuki and also a uh, great presentation by um, Anjali there, um, who's covered you know, a, a, a really nice history, a really you know, detailed drug discovery um, and opportunities in space. So that's very exciting. Um, so my presentation is really going to talk about, um, you know, the field of astromedicine and astropharmacy, um, which I'm currently uh, working on at the moment. Um, so my name is Tej Shivakumar. I'm currently a second year PhD student at the University of Nottingham, um, and I'm um, also part of the astromedicine and astropharmacy program, which I'll be talking about uh, today. So an introduction to the program at Nottingham. Um, so you might be wondering what astromedicine and astropharmacy is. The term is relatively new, um, but in a nutshell, um, it is a field that deals with medical and pharmaceutical challenges that we will be facing, uh, particularly during long duration space missions. Um, this field was uh, actually started by my supervisor, Professor Phil Williams at the University of Nottingham School of Pharmacy uh, back in 2019, um, where uh, a group of us six PhD students started out um, and we're all actually currently in second year at the moment as well. So the six of us are actually based in uh, this campus um, here uh, in Nottingham. Nottingham is, is actually pretty much in the centre of the UK uh, and we're all based um, in, inside the School of Pharmacy, which is pictured uh, on the left here. So I thought I'll tell you a little bit about what we're all involved in and what kind of projects there are out there. So if any of you are interested um, in, in this exciting new field, you will be able to see just how many unanswered questions there are still um, that you can actually uh, pick on and, and try to answer. So between the six of us, uh, there are two themes. So myself, um, here at the top and Molly, uh, we are both looking at drug discover um, sorry drug manufacturing um, in space, whereas all the others um, pictured here are more in the life sciences, biology, uh, physiology field. So I know you and Lisa's, um past webinars in the same series covered all of these um, aspects in life sciences, biology and physiology. So I definitely recommend uh, that you check out their uh, past webinars already, but I won't go too much into detail there at the moment. So my project um, is really um, to do with um, addressing the problem of um, pharmaceuticals in space. So we all know that um, pharmaceuticals have a fixed shelf life, uh, just like food, it does expire one day. Um, and we also know that humans are now going to be traveling further um, to different planets potentially even um, outside our solar system in the future. So if you think about how long a round trip uh, to Mars take, you would say about three years, um, it's a relatively long time. And knowing that some of the pharmaceuticals degrade in about a year or two years, there's now a problem. Most of these medicines are going to expire during um, the round trip to Mars, for example. Or if you wanted to even do an extended stay on the moon, uh, that will be a problem there. So this is this is the question that I'm trying to address through my research. Um, Molly is also looking at um, how we can actually improve the shelf life of these pharmaceuticals in space uh, from the environmental stresses such as radiation um, and microgravity. Um, and she's also researching um, in this field using um, exciting new extrema files. So the life science aspects to mention briefly, um, so Macaulay, George and Ewan, they're all involved in um, 
projects such as improving immune cell function pharmacologically in microgravity. Um, and Ewan's also looking at how different is the glucose uptake in astronaut skeletal muscles. Now, George is in the food bioscience side more than uh, the pharmacology as such, but to briefly mention his project, he is actually working with strawberries and cold plasma treatment and trying to improve the nutritional value and the quality of foods that we take up into space. So these two projects in particular are, are involved in the use of, a, uh, of an RCCS, so a rotational cell culture system that is made to actually simulate microgravity here in our labs uh, that can be used to study these effects. Um, although the true microgravity environment is present on um, things like the International Space Station. So the really good aspect about uh, the research that's happening in our group is we form a bubble. We are trying to answer questions that are really related to each other. Um, and actually, Dan here is the engineer of our group. So um, he is actually working on developing a uh, fluorescent imager and a CubeSat, a 1U CubeSat, uh, that will carry all of our biological payloads um, um, in microgravity and test them there. So to give you a brief overview on the science and the cells that we use particularly, um, so for the drug manufacturing and, and, and uh, protection of pharmaceuticals, we are really working with extremophiles and all the other students who are involved in the life science aspect work with plant and animal cells. I have the pleasure of working with this extraordinary extremophile called uh, Dinococcus radiodurans. Um, it is actually in the Ghost Book of World Records as the most toughest organism on the planet, uh, which is quite quite an award, I would say. So I'm trying to um, study this extremophile and see if we can use it to actually carry uh, proteins and try to um, uh, manufacture proteins on site, on demand in space. Um, Molly works with another extremophile called Halobacterium salinarium. Now, this is not bacteria, but actually a type of archaea. Um, and Molly is particularly interested in this archaea because of its extraordinary cell membrane. So she's, act she's actually wanting to use some parts of the cell membrane of this extremophile to try and encapsulate the drug of interest and try to prolong the shelf life um, and stability and activity, so on. We've also got members working with C2C12 cells, which are a type of muscle cells, uh, skeletal muscle cells, THB1 cells, which are a type of immune cells, um, and also an enzyme called polyphenol oxidase. So this is a plant enzyme. Many of you will be aware of it because if you've ever tried to take a bite of an apple and then you've left it on your desk um, at your homes, in your kitchens, uh, for a while, you would have noticed that it forms a brown coating on top. That is actually due to the activity of the polyphenol oxidase enzyme um, and it's, it's the well-known browning effect um, in, in fruits. So George actually studies this enzyme and wants to study in microgravity to see how foods go off or, or are ruined in microgravity and how we can actually tap into that and try to prolong the nutritional value of it um, in, in space for astronauts long duration space missions. So like I said, we're using the extreme of felts to really um, make advances in drug manufacturing and drug delivery um, and the plants and animal side of, um, of uh, the research is really used to understand the effects of microgravity. So hopefully I've, I've, I've provided a good summary of, of the research that's happening in our group, um, but I'd like to tell you a bit more about my PhD project, which is very much focused on the space pharmacology area um, and the theme of this webinar. So introducing biomanufacturing in space. So NASA did an experiment, I think back in 2014, called the Bionutrients Experiment. And if you can see this little device here, um, we've got a chamber here, which is filled with dried yeast, the microorganism, and then a syringe looking um, um, part of, of the instrument here, which is actually used to pump water in. So if you recall, anything that is in a dried state, particularly microorganisms, are uh, metabolically inactive. So once you add water to the dry yeast, the yeast now become metabolically active and they were actually programmed, in this case by NASA, to produce antioxidants. There's lots of radiation in space. That's been emphasized by Anjali as well. So there's galactocosmic radiation, the solar particle events um, that are 
every that that is everywhere in space. We are protected inside the Earth, but on a mission to Mars and the Moon, we're going to be less protected. So astronauts are always exposed to radiation, and that means the amount of reactive oxygen species that is being accumulated in this body is also high. Antioxidants can really help um, combat that. That's why it's important for astronauts to actually have a lot of antioxidants. Um, so I think here in NASA, we're trying to see how by taking a small instrument on the ISS, they could actually produce something of interest without having to take the antioxidants in its own nature from Earth to space every time. So this experiment actually gave rise to this to this field of exciting new field of space synthetic biology. Um, and the on demand biomanufacturing in space is really a subset of this field. So on demand biomanufacturing means to manufacture something in space on demand when you want it and how you want it to um, without having to take it from Earth. This is very valuable. Um, this way you can produce food, you can produce medicines, biomaterials um, in space. So to give you a, a, a really good example, microorganisms can be pretty much programmed to produce whatever we want biologically. So recently it was demonstrated that microorganisms can actually be uh, programmed to synthesize cement. Now this could be a breakthrough when we're looking at building um, those colonies on the moon and on Mars. Imagine taking bags and bags of cement with us from Earth to the moon. It will be much easier to take a bunch of microorganisms and get them to make it for us on site. So this is the aim of on-demand biomanufacturing. And the interesting aspect of this field is that if we can manufacture in space, we can manufacture anywhere. We can manufacture in Antarctica. We can manufacture in a human relief camp. We can manufacture in any low resource environment that we want. So my project is particularly looking at uh, medicines, on-demand biomanufacturing of medicines. Um, and the great thing about my project is also that, although I'm aiming to, to have, find a solution to be applied in space, it means these medicines can now become accessible to many, many people who do not have access to medicines around the world. Millions and billions of people still don't have access to life-saving medicines because either it is too costly for them or they don't have the logistics to get them to the place that they want to. Coal storage, coal storage is an important aspect of transportation and storage of, uh, of medicines and keeping them active um, to get our desired response. By having a system that you can use to manufacture on site, we would no longer need to have coal storage. That would be a huge break breakthrough for space and for people on Earth. So you might be wondering, how am I going to achieve this? So I'm actually researching um, um, a technique called cell-free protein synthesis. So you might know protein synthesis to take place inside cells. So cells are grown, they are transformed, they are then incubated, and then um, uh, the protein of interest is harvested. That's how it usually takes place. But with cell-free protein synthesis, it basically means protein synthesis without the cells. So to give you an overview of how I actually achieve this in, in the laboratory, I grow cells um, and then subject them to um, lysis, so commonly through sonication, um, and then you have a crude extract. This crude extract will have broken pieces of the membranes and the intracellular components. What I then do is clarify this extract um, to remove the membranes and I then obtain a transcription, transcriptionally and translationally active extract. Now this extract has everything that I need to kickstart protein synthesis. We will then be able to add a number of other items to this mixture. Amino acids, ions, energy to keep the reaction going as fuel, and DNA. Now DNA is the important aspect here. DNA codes for what you want to express, right? So it is really a it is really like a plug and play mechanism where you put in whatever DNA that you want to get the protein of choice expressed in this in this mixture here. So ultimately, 
these three steps can really take place on Earth, but this, re this reaction here can take place anywhere in space, in Antarctica, in a submarine, anywhere that we want. This is only possible because of the open nature of this reaction here. Um, it is very difficult, if you think about it, to keep cells alive in extreme environments such as space, because you would have to maintain a gaseous environment, a temperature, uh, potentially shaking, and also you'd have to carry media for it as well, not to mention the DNA and transformation reagents. So this is a relatively simple procedure that can then be um, further researched to contain different formats. A lyophilized format, like um, what AstraZeneca is doing, um, reaction on paper, and things like that. So at the moment, I'm currently working on optimizing the system um, to produce therapeutic proteins that astronauts need the most. So things like um, um, medications to help them with radiation. And also, um, there was a really great talk by Dr. Li Xian this morning highlighting the uh, bone loss that astronauts go through every day in space. Uh, they lose about 1% per month. And a very important um, therapeutic protein called teriparatide is actually used to solve that problem. So we can even express teriparatide this way. At the moment, I am using GFP to characterize the system um, and try to optimize it further until I do any further experiments with it. But this is the general idea. So hopefully I've given you a good overview on what kind of research that is actually taking place in our group right now. Um, there's still loads of loads of unanswered questions, like I mentioned, um, and we'd really need all the people that we can. Um, I think especially um, Anjali had, had emphasised in 30 years how our lives uh, and, and, and the outer space environment is going to look like. So I strongly believe that there is going to be a really, really good career opportunity for, for new students uh, that are becoming interested in this field. So that leads me on to discuss routes for, for people that are interested in this exciting field of space pharmacology. Uh, but I thought before I um, go into some of the tips and recommendations, I will give you a little um, um, introduction to me. Um, so my, I actually have a pretty straightforward route to the PhD in astromedicine and astropharmacy. Um, I completed high school in India, which is where I'm from originally, um, and then I moved to the UK to pursue a bachelor's in biological sciences. Um, so this was in the University of Surrey, which is near London, and this was a four year course. So then I started my PhD um, after immediately. Although this seems like a pretty straightforward route, I actually did a lot of things in between that really helped me get to where I am today. I did many internships, both after high school and also during um, every summer uh, of my undergraduate degree. So that really helped me gain an understanding of the standard laboratory practices and how to perform research in general. I then completed an industrial placement at Vertex Pharmaceuticals in Oxford. So this was a one year sandwich placement. So I spent my year three of university actually learning about how the pharmaceutical industry works, very much in relation to the, the drug discovery pipeline that Anjali showed before. Um, I was looking at uh, protein biochemistry, structural biology, um, high throughput screening, assays, and also lead optimization. So this is where I really got an idea of how the pharmaceutical industry works and actually how people get their life-saving medicines delivered to them. And then I also completed a research project again after I came back to Surrey. Um, this was also very much focused on protein expression, um, working with DNA, RNA. Um, and then once I started my PhD, I, I also involved in projects uh, with my group, uh, with the other PhD students in microgravity. So actually, I would say that my interest in this pace sector actually uh, came to be around the time of my industrial placement, um, which is relatively late compared to most people. So this was just one year before I started my PhD. And while I was working with Vertex Pharmaceuticals, while I saw, you know, the manufacturing process and the way that we store and then the way that we transport pharmaceuticals, that got me wondering, what do people in space do? What, how do astronauts get access to medicines that they need in space? And how do people manage this when they go to Mars or even further afield? So this is where I really got interested. So I would say there's no there's no right time to get 
involved in space. There's no, you don't need to have um, a huge um, talent or a huge um, interest in space from a very early age. Um, it doesn't matter. I think the main thing um, that keeps me going in this field is curiosity. How, why, what and how. So if you are wanting, if, if you do want to get involved in this field, I do have a, uh, a few recommendations and tips for you. So for me personally, internships were the greatest um, source of knowledge and hands on techniques um, throughout the course of my career, which is not a lot, to be honest. Um, so I definitely recommend that you pursue some kind of internship. Um, this really gives you an overview of what well, basically the groundwork of the laboratory uh, research that you will do in this field. Um, and although space pharmacology, space synthetic biology is um, has an eye on space, most of the research that you will do is very much focused on um, normal pharmacolo uh, pharmacology or normal synthetic biology. So it is important to have a fundamental understanding of research that is taking place in that field. There are lots and lots of internships, actually. Um, I do know that a lot of space agencies um, like NASA and the European Space Agency, they're doing a lot of internships um, that typically are aimed at um, undergraduates or master students. Um, so before you start a PhD or if you are thinking about a PhD. But also what I did one summer was just to approach a professor who I thought was involved in a really exciting field of research and asked him if I could spend a couple of weeks in his lab. Um, and which he gladly agreed to. So a lot of people will be open to to get more students enrolled. Um, so it can be as simple as that um, in academia. And also the other thing is awareness. So these webinars are also so great um, because you know you have uh, you get the chance to see what people are doing and what opportunities are out there. Um, so it's really great that um, if you are considering this, you're here already. I also think that conferences and student societies play a really big role um, in your sorry in your development um, in in your personal development as well um, because if you've um, if you do uh, want to go and get involved in these experimenting uh, techniques in microgravity or hypergravity you would also find that it's mostly a team based project um, that will uh, that will be necessary and for this you need to be able to find a good team and really work with people um, although you are performing your own research and most of these networks really come from those conferences and student societies so United Nations um, Office for Outer Space Affairs they're great and my favorite um, sort of themes that they have are access to space for all initiative space for health and the space for youth campaign I feel these are more related to space pharmacology and you can meet lots and lots of people at the webinar and at the networking events as well um, and a lot of information out there on that website as well so please do check that out space generation advisory council they're also great for students and young professionals um, so if you're already in industry you can still be a part of the space generation advisory council they have lots of competitions they have lots of networking events and you can really really meet like-minded people um, and again for both of these um, UNUSA and SJAC you don't there is no nationality um, requirement so it's open to everyone Things like the National Student Space Conference, um, they're also um, um, for students who are working in the space sector and you can also meet like minded people there. So I would say that uh, these are these are some of the key requirements and also some things that can really help you get your way around while you're still new to the sector. Uh, but there's just so much so many things out there to help you. So please do check them out. So I know this has been a lot of information, but I hope you find it useful. Um, so I'd say thank you very much. Um, and if you do want to ask me any questions, please do so in the chat. But also if you feel uh, that you've forgotten your question or would like to ask me later, um, here are my contact details. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ted, for a really interesting presentation. I think it was really interesting that you were able to see the different things that were happening at the U.S.
coming from. And also, thank you so much for the advice at the end. Um, as she mentioned, our UN Lisa Access to Space for Initiative is open. Um, we have two applications, um, two programs open now, so um, please join in us. And also, um, in our first webinar of this series, we talked about the different associations. So she mentioned SGAC, but um, especially for hypergravity and microgravity, there are associations like in the US ASGSR, which Angeli is also a part of. There's ELGRA, which is the European one. And also um, we introduced a Japanese association, but still there's Korean associations, Chinese associations, and, and there's so many people that you can reach out to and go ask for help or any advice. So please make sure to remember all these people associations and try to reach out to them whenever you have the chance. So thank you so much for that inspiring talk. Okay, I see a lot of questions um, in the chat. I know some of them have been answered by Anjali in the chat, but I'd like to ask her in person again. So um, I'd like to go back to, the, I think the first one is from Mike. Um, he was talking about um, one of the slides that Anjali has put up um, about the companies working in space. So she, he wanted to know, can you talk about how you decide um, that there is a cost benefit of doing this work in space? So what barriers can be addressed by Axiom and other companies to reduce these costs to encourage more access to space? So Anjali, I know you answered it on the chat, but maybe you can elaborate. Absolutely, um, and thank you to Michael for that great question. Um, essentially, Axiom is an infrastructure company. And so we're building a space station. We are building state of the art technologies. We're looking for um, uh, cost efficiencies. Um, we're standardizing our operations. And um, also we are a commercial company. So uh, this really has to, the project has to align with the company's internal strategy and direction. Um, you know, it, the company typically does their cost benefit analysis and then determines whether investment in a space project is something that will um, provide the appropriate return on that investment. So, uh, and then from our end, from an Axiom end, we provide the infrastructure, we, we provide access to space, we provide crew time. And while we're building the space station in the interim, we are providing flight opportunities as well as um, crew time, um, payload, up mass, down mass, and all of the logistics and in integration. So if you consider this to be a, a innovation platform, microgravity or space as an innovation platform, just like any other drug discovery platform, um, this can be that analogy. So if a company feels that they can um, invest and, and reap those benefits, um, then that's up to them to decide uh, whether that's an appropriate investment. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Angeli. And for um, research organizations, um, academia, there are more opportunities. I say that is supported by the government or supported by agencies. Um, for commercial companies to start their operations, it might um, there might be more hurdles. But if you're a student, if you're working for um, yeah a research institution or academia, I think the hurdles are less. So I mean, um, the UN opportunities are basically open to research institutions and um, universities, academia, and all that as well. So I know there's a lot of different levels of entry into this field, but um, it's great that um, there are more opportunities now and the costs are coming low. Okay, um, the next question um, is from Carlos. He was asking, what are the differences in drug absor absorption, distribution, and elimination in microgravity? Angeli, if you can elaborate again on this one. Absolutely. Um, again, you know, there... Uh, while there have been about 300, sorry, 600 astronauts who have actually um, visited space, information on their health and, um, uh, you know, in this case, um, uh, ADME talks is just simply not available. These are um, uh, private studies, private um, data that have not been publicly released. And so the information is just not there to do the analysis. Or if it is, it's very, um, uh, desperate, it's not consistently available, and thus making it hard to do any um, proper studies with controls. And here again, you know, as we start to fly astronauts um, through private astronaut missions, and as we start to increase that cadence, 
um, more and more people visiting space will start to develop databases, will start to develop um, uh, you know, data um, that may or may not be accessible. Again, um, you know, this is all under, under um, development right now, um, but it, the data just simply is not available. Um, the second point that I want to make is all of the astronauts are, you know, above average. Um, if you look at anyone in this group, unless you're an astronaut, you know, your physiology is on the average end. Um, mine is, but astronauts typically they train, they have, um, they're just much more fit. So they're outliers. Um, so I can expect that there will be fewer adverse events. And if they are, they are unlikely to be reported again for privacy reasons. Um, and I actually defer to um, Tage as well. Perhaps um, she has experience working from um, the European Space Agency side on whether there are any available studies. Yeah, but I would agree with everything that you said, Anjali. Um, the data is not there, and also um, astronauts are relatively um, fit people, well, if not the fittest people. Um, personally, I haven't done any studies on this, and this is not too relevant to my project. Um, but my thoughts are that um, with regards to space tourism, which is also uh, predicted to increase um, in the future, in the near future, and also exponentially in the far future, I think this is going to be a much, much more deeper topic. And as you said, there's going to be lots of new databases being developed for um, each age group and also uh, people with underlying health conditions as well. That's very important to note. And especially for cardiovascular drugs, um, our understanding of ADME in, in spaces has to be quite accurate um, to be able to uh, make sure that it, it is still doing what it's supposed to and not having toxic side effects. And I just want to add one comment as um, Tej was speaking is that, you know, for those of you who are interested in this topic, again, this is a great opportunity to start jumping in and investigating, um, thinking about what sort of processes you would set up. Um, you can Google and find out who's working in this space and I can guarantee you there's probably half, less than half a dozen individuals right now. So this is a really great opportunity to jump into some of these topics of interest and um, start building your your career and deepening that expertise. Okay, thank you both for that answer. I think it was very clear. Um, the next question is from Madhavan. Any thoughts on simulation software for operational pharmacology experiments in space that can be used by the general public, which is either open source or private? So. So yeah, um, he's asking about software that can be used by the public. I am not aware. Um, I think that would require a quick Google search on my end. Um, I, I'm sorry, I'm just not familiar with anything that's open source for. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar with any either. OK, thank you. Um, if there's any um, and anyone in the crowd knows, um, please write it in the chat as well. Um, we're always learning. Um, the next question is also from Carlos. Do you expect some changes in gene expression due to radiation in space? So absolutely. Um, so I have a friend at NASA Ames who is um, doing quite a bit of uh, radiation studies. His name is um, um, Sergio Santa Maria. Um, please Google and look up his work. There's also another leading scientist. Her name is Elizabeth Blaber, and she's done quite a bit of um, research in radiation and um, gene expression. So both of those are really great resources um, and um, can provide you with additional information. Yeah, just to just to add to that, um, we definitely know that there is changes in gene expression. Um, in radiation, which, which is what your question was about, but also in microgravity. Um, and also this will really affect uh, the extract quality that I was mentioning about earlier as well. Um, so in fact, what we wanted to do as a group um, in a European Space Agency um, parabolic flight experiment was to put all, all the five types of cells together because they all formed a really nice um, a bank for the cell, the, all the cells of life. So we had plants, we had animals, we had bacteria, we had archaea, um, and then we had a plant enzyme as well. 
so we were really interested in studying how um, microgravity, um, if there was any difference in the proteomic profile of all of these cells, and was there any uh, commonalities, were there any differences between the three domains of life as well? So that is also that's also a really good question because um, it's not researched too much in detail, um, and especially if you're looking at radiation, um, the facility um, to actually um, simulate radiation, especially space radiation, is very, very rare. And um, I think there is only one currently that NASA is using, um, which is a radiation uh, bombardment facility. Um, and it is quite um, difficult to get access to and it's quite expensive there as well. So the only way to truly find out would be to actually run this experiment in true microgravity and true radiation, which is in space. Thank you both. Maybe, Angela, if you can write down the names of the researchers that you mentioned in the chat, that would help people when they um, do their Google search. Um, the last question I see right now is from Itamar. Um, how would you have to amend redesign medication to deal with reactivation of dormant viruses in a zero or low gravity environment? So if, if I can start while um, Anjali is replying in the chat. Um, so this is, the, you raise a good point in which we, we we will have to be in a position to actually amend the dosage um, of the medication that we are taking up or manufacturing in space. Um, so there is no one size fits all, even with regards to the whole personalized medicine field that's um, gaining traction on earth. It is important to be able to um, to change the dosages and also the method of delivery perhaps as well um, in space. Um, but there is again not a lot of information available um, even with regards to reactivation of dormant viruses and not much in the changing of medications and dosages side. So to actually combine these two together would be an entirely novel field. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Anjali. Do you have anything to add to that or? You know, I'm just thinking about the question. Um, how would you have to amend redesign medication to deal with reactivation of dormant viruses in a zero low gravity environment? I mean, we know that, I mean, currently on the space station, um, um, uh, microorganisms, you know, they're, they're, they're alive and they're kicking, you know, they're, they're um, new species being recognized or identified. Um, so it'll be, um, yeah, I, I'm at a loss for ideas right now, but I would say, you know, do some experiments. Um, this is definitely where we'd have to do some empirical studies to understand um, how those could be reactivated. Actually, I would think, you know, how would you want to, um, Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have enough knowledge to um, to respond to your question, but great question. Okay, thank you so much, both. Um, I do not see any more questions at the moment, so if you have any more, you, um, this is your last chance. But thank you so much to Dr. Anjali Gupta and to our student speaker, Ted Shivakumar. Um, these were amazing presentations that had a lot of information. Maybe it was too much for you, but of course we have the presentations and recordings. Um, we will have them on our website soon. So um, if you missed out on anything, you can review them. And also if you have any questions, you can send it to them. And also if you have any, you can put it in our questionnaire form. So thank you again both for this amazing presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, this was actually our last webinar about life science. Um, we've gone through biology, physiology, pharmacology in these three weeks. Um, they're all interconnected and they were very, um, there were many different things um, mentioned. It was really interesting. I think we have a wonderful collection of presentations and recordings that really introduce you to these different fields. And I think it would really help you to gain knowledge and also to really support you when you have your hands on um, opportunities in the many different um, platforms that all the speakers mentioned. So thank you so much to all the amazing speakers for um, 
really um, showing us how amazing life science is in hypergravity and microgravity. But from next week, as you can see, we will dive into physical science. So moving on to material science, fluid dynamics, and all of that. So um, please make sure to join um, in next week as well. Same time, same place. Um, it will be a different um, topic of science, but uh, we'll have amazing speakers as well, really enlightening us with their um, R&D there. So please make sure to join us. So. Um, um, before you leave, um, please answer our questionnaire form. We really, really want to hear your feedback on our webinars. We really want to um, provide better webinars. And if there's any harsh comments, we're happy to hear that as well because we really want to progress. So please let us know in the questionnaire. Also, um, as I said earlier, this is being recorded. The presentation is already up, but we will put the recordings on our website as soon as possible. So um, please check that out and also share it with your colleagues, friends, um, students that missed out today um, we will try to put it up as soon as possible so um thank you again to both speakers to Angeli and Tej thank you for everyone who joined in us um thank you for engaging um sending us questions and we really hope to see you again soon um yeah next week same time same place so until then take care everyone and have a nice day thank you